We have Jerry Bird here with us today. He was in the first class of the Hall of Fame in 2010. Jerry, tell me what got you skydiving? Girls. <laughs> uh, there's two things. Uh, I told you I grew up in West Virginia and I was lured by the surfing music and California girls and the lifestyle and everything. And so as soon as I could get away from a steel town like Pittsburgh, but I was not in Pittsburgh. I was in a little town called Wharton, West Virginia, but essentially it was one big steel mill. That's what made me go to California. I said, when I'm out of school, I'll go as far as away I could. I went up to the water, to Santa Monica. I wanted to be a surfer. So I said, am I albino? So on day one, I win the Jerry Bird sunburn contest. All day on the beach in the sun, I burned so bad they had to take me to the emergency room. Oh, but while I'm doing this, I first thing I bought was a surfboard. I couldn't even hardly swim, but I got a surfboard. I got blonde hair, right? But one of the days, very early after I was in California, I see a guy come along on a biplane, and he jumps, walks out on the wing, and dumps. The plane's not 1,200 feet, but like a static line jump, you know, the airplane's going one way, he's not falling at terminal velocity. So he opens, does a few oscillations, turns and lands on the beach. All the girls and everybody, Yahoo, that was, I said, looks a lot better than surfing. I'm sprayed of water. I go, man, that's was cool. If I ever saw anybody or could do that, I would. It wasn't a couple weeks. I'm going to a bar. A whole bunch of people I knew at my age run away from that town at that time. And a couple of them were rock and roll players, so they had a band. And I go, well, I go to where they hang out, band, girls, all this. And they're the lead singer, is a friend of mine, and all that. So I go there and I'm hanging out, and I meet a girl, and it's probably Thursday night. And I go, well, can, can we hook up? Like, make a date on Saturday? And she goes, no. I go, oh, hell. And I go, why not? She goes, oh, I'm going out of town. And I went, ah, eh, okay. And she goes, I'm going skydiving. I went, take me, take me. She goes, oh, everybody says that, and we won't go. And I go, I'll go. Lo and Bill, she calls her a guy, the instructor. Saturday, they come by, they pick me up, and we're in L.A., and we drive north to this, uh, Lancaster, like before Taft or Arvin or stuff, and I make my first static line jump that day. And that was with Brian Williams, who I feel is, if I'm the father of L.R.L.'s work, he's the grandfather. He's the man who taught me to skydive. He was Mr. Cool. He's SCR number eight, meaning he came in eighth on the first eight way. And so Brian really taught me in an AFF manner. Altitude's our friend, so the higher we go, the better. The ground's our enemy. And I think I did that day, though, the girl had made one jump prior. She refused to jump. So he has to get her out of the door and move her around in the Cessna. I get in the door and jump. And later, I didn't know this. You know, I mean, we jumped. And so we're, you know, still up fairly early. I mean, it's only noontime or something. And he goes, well, we get packed up, we jump again. And I went, what, we do this more than once? He goes, yeah, it's like sex. The more times you do it, the more fun it is. <laughs> I went, great, I'm in. So I think that weekend I made three jumps. The next time we go, he goes, hey, you've got to do a clear and pull. And then we're going up. He goes, you know, how? and what he did is a static line, which was different than AFF. Do you remember when we went through the radio, talk the student down? He would just take the Cessna on and climb a little bit and come back over top and jump right over top of you. And as he fell by, you yell at you and pull and then say, follow me, turn left, follow me, turn right. And then follow him in and land right beside him. He talked you right into landing. So, and he always wore what he was wearing on the street. 
You wore a hush puppy. She didn't wear jump boots. And Brian was noted for doing stand-ups. He landed soft. That's better than rolling in the dirt. How do you impress the pretty girl if you land in front of her and you got a broken arm when you're done? Kapunk. But you do a stand-up in front of the girls and then you ask them, could you help save my life and help me pack my round parachute because I need somebody to lean back in the harness and hold tension. So he goes, now you have a captive audience for 15 minutes while you flake your parachute and pack it and get to know the people. And he goes, that's what landing is about. You don't land over there in the dirt and roll around in the dirt with your nice clothes on. Land next to your car, land where you're going to tie your parachute onto. So he was a great spotter. He always did stand ups. I did with, I made over 3,000 jumps on round parachutes. At different times, I made 100 stand ups in a row. And that means I landed soft. And I could do that with a round parachute. I never hurt myself skydiving. But tw like 20 years after I quit skydiving, I break my ass falling out of a tree. Find out I'm a bird, but you still can't fly. <laughs> so. So, Jerry, tell me about the environment. You're, as, as you mentioned, you're known as the father of RW. So what, what was the new thing when you were a student? And, and where did you take it? Where? Well, I'll tell you what. For all the high tech and the cameras and what we're doing here today, people don't realize that a golden era of skydiving was the mid 60s here in Southern California. And there's two or three reasons. One, there was a TV program called Ripcord that was on weekly about skydiving and you're seeing actors where skydivers were actually playing skydivers. And the guys I skydiving with, Bob McCore and Lee Hunt and Lyle Cameron and Bob Sinclair, these guys were on TV. You know, and then you go, so oh, that's pretty cool. And they jump with us on the weekend. And boom, Bob McCore, who's in the Hall of Fame, he's making, he was my best friend at that time. He was tall, dark, and handsome. He worked in Hollywood. He was the number one cameraman in the world at that time. And when he put the camera down, he was the best guy to her. So he was everybody's hero. He flew like these rich guys out here, he flew to the drop zone in his own private plane, in a Swift 125. He went, well, ain't that cool? You know, you're on an airplane and everything. But he jumped state-of-the-art equipment. So that was about the movies. But he died making the movie Don't Make Waves with Tony Curtis and Gina Lola Bridger and Sharon Tate, who got killed by the Manson murders. And these guys were doing outrageous stuff. And a guy talking out here, jumping, you know, the, no rigs and the hidden rigs and everything. Then the Don't Make We at Waves, they jumped at Malibu. Bob's wearing full movie, 35 millimeter camera this big with a weight belt. The other guy's a TV recorder who accidentally falls out of the airplane. He was wearing a harness with a round reserve stuffed under his t-shirt. One parachute. They did this jump over and over and over. The idea was, you spot here, it's early morning, the cameraman lands on the beach, the guy with a little parachute lands in the water, the boat picks him up. They did this for like four days like that. The FAA one day don't give them permission to jump in the in the morning. You have to jump in the afternoon. The winds change. Cameraman's landing in the water for the first time with his huge camera with the weights on. No flotation. He said, "I got so much stuff on flotation belts that could help me." But what killed Bob Bucor was instead of taking that million dollar camera off and chucking it, like cameramen do with a big helmet, they take it off and they hold it by the chin strap. When he hits the water going in, he first right by the pickup boat. The camera is buoyant. He clips the camera through his cheekbone and eye, and it knocks him out. 
the boat thinks she's okay. They're never supposed to pick up the cameraman. The guy on the little reserve is way over there. So they go for him. Bob never comes back to the surface. We find him the next day sitting on the floor holding the camera, still on his hand. But Don't Make Waves was a full-time movie. And then the Gypsy Boss, who was the epitome of skydiving and for public consumption. I said, the old days, here again, this is a road show, like these guys today with their wingsuits. I want to be the first to land it. The first guy in the net. I want to be the first. That was the theme of the Gypsy Moss. I want to land it. I want to fly the wing. But I thought what was the thing, iconically, they got Gene Hackman, who's an Oscar award winning. They got Burt Lancaster. They got these top of the line actresses and actors playing that. And it's a total skydiving movie. And it's about, on a words you can't say, sex, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. The heroes, the barnstormers come to town, they chase the women, they do the guy's wife, the guy that wants to jump the wingsuit, most spectacular bounce ever filmed for a movie, you know, wingsuit goes dying, that never happened. And then they packed their gear like the Army Golden Knights road team and said, we're on our way, hey, next week you're jumping the wingsuit. But these are major motion pictures. So everybody in Southern California is on television on this. We win a competition in 70 by the guy called the Webster Sweepstakes. And he, at first he was just going to pick people because he wanted to demonstrate RW to the world. But he held a competition. Well, my team won it. And first place was a free trip around the world on me. Filmed by Ray Cottingham, Hall of Famer, Carl Banish, Hall of Famer, organized by Jerry Bird, call it Hall of Famer. We're on the cover of that calendar I have. So we go to Bled Yugoslavia in 1970 as the world's first free fall exhibition team and put on demos. 100% free. Ted Webster said guys were fighting with their wives because you're going to Europe for 30 days, you SOB. Ted goes, can bring your wife. I pick up the tab. I got a girl living with and girlfriend. You can bring your girlfriend. I pick up the tab. Bring your dog. I'll pick up the tab. It's 100% free. I quit my job as a computer programmer and systems analyst and everything and became a full time skydiver at that time. So it was a success. One, I was surrounded by amazing people that were making the movies. Bob Corwin, when I first met him, he's jumping a motorized Nikon, could switch to fisheye lenses or this or that. He's got a Newton concentric ring sight, which a lot of people still tell you was the best ring sight in the world. He got a battery operated motorized Nikon, and he's jumping and shooting 16 millimeter movie cameras. So we went and watched our skydives we're standing like the 130 way out here the other day, you're watching on TV. We went to Hollywood and watched them in a movie theater, full size. So we, we got spoiled. What's this little thing on the TV you're showing us? We saw full size skydiving by one of the great cameramen in the world. I was lucky that I was always surrounded by somebody. The Bob McCor was a great friend of mine, and he was at that time the leading cameraman. There was always somebody filming on our jumps. And then Carl Banish was dating one of my roommates, girl, this girl's uh, sister-in-law or something. And so Carl became my buddy real quick. And so he, were in his movie Sky Capers and Masters of the Sky. But when my team started winning every competition and setting every record, and then later we went to be a demo team in 72 and made some of, I believe, the greatest demo jumps ever, wearing smoke, filmed by Carl Banish. Randy Forbes has edited it into a 72 at Tahlequah with the All-Stars. Or the 24 way they're going to recreate here was on Life magazine. Have you seen the I've Got a Secret? For the world out there, you've got to look called I've Got a Secret. 1972 with Alan Alda. 
how old is the guy from MASH, the doctor. MASH series started that year. Steve Allen's the host. They got a panel. The 24 ways the film, they got the circle of people. All these guys are, recreate, are here from that group in a circle. And the person, that, and this is 1972, so I can't add that, 47 years ago, the guy who comes out from behind the curtain is me. So that's a real, it's on YouTube, but you got to Google exactly, I've got a secret, 1972, Alan Alda, and that'll pop up. And so these things are on national TV, we're on the cover of Life magazine, you know. So there's a media blitz now of all the different high altitudes and stuff, but in, I'm telling you, in the 60s, there was a media blitz there. The only movies you could buy about skydiving we were in. The only posters you could buy of unique skydives were us that Carl Banish had took. And any other thing in the movies were all done by the people in Southern California. And that's how I sort of got into it. I happened to step into one, the very beginning, and I stepped into what I think considered was the other very cool laid back people that give skydivers their Proviance, give me that word, promenades, the ambiance that they have today. That being cool is cool. Never any fights on skydives. You might disagree with people. Skydivers don't steal from each other. And it's a lifestyle. I couldn't get my big brother to let me drive his car. The first day when I make my jump, I owe beer. First jump. So there's still a tradition back then. I rode with the other people. I don't have a car. A guy that's one of the regular jumpers goes here, take mine, throws me his keys. I got a keys of a guy I don't know, and I go, which one is it? He goes, it's that new Corvette right there. I'm 20 years old or so. I go take this guy's Corvette and don't even know him drive it to town, buy the beer, come back. Here's your keys, thank you, sir. Hey, sir, we're friends, you're a skydiver. So the camaraderie that I've started with and carried over till this day, and just to keep talking, I'm here because of a reunion of my teams of that, the friends of my youth, my teams of the 69s and me a hippie at that time, 70 winning that meet to go around the world, 72 winning the national championships, first ever in 10 way. And I'm seeing some of those people almost for the first time since then, because I left that year. So it was quite nostalgic for me to come back. So my friends had me fly into Burbank. I don't even recognize Southern California. I left in 72. The picture of us over Paris Valley, you can't even tell. There's a desert down there and everything. And so I tell them, my two good friends, I don't know anybody at Paris Valley. I said, I knew the Canasters a long time ago, and Dan BC, but he's probably busy. And we couldn't even find a place. We think the wind tunnel probably sets a long ways away from where the people are gonna be. So we drive all over the place. So now we drive in. We park way out there, and I'm limping with my thing, getting in here. And I'm about tired, and I go, you know, when there's people lecturing, I always have the thing, don't talk. Somebody is up there talking. So let's just sit down right here. So we sit down right here, and we go, I go, well, see, I look around, and there's people in the airplane. I don't know anybody, but let's just take a breather here. And about that time, coincident or not, I don't know that the 128-way, 130-way group is here, okay? And they are just starting, or I got their group together for their debrief. And one of the leaders made eye contact with me, sitting a uh, hundred feet away on that bench. And he told Dieter, that was Patrick, and the 130 people turned around and spontaneously gave me probably a 10 minute standing ovation. When my two friends that hadn't seen me or knew anything about me after I left California, me saying I don't know any, Dieter and Peter uh, and Patrick Pass are like my sons. 
and I go, this is my group from World Team. And I go, I knew like every one of them, but they had me teared up. And Sam and Raylene, my two friends, go, Bert, how does this stuff happen? They didn't know I was coming. I didn't know they were here, and I didn't know because they had to hold their backs turned what that group was even. Magic. It's amazing. We and take a break? Like whatever drop zone you go to. So, can you tell me about any very memorable jump? What One that stands out more than most? Well, you know, you know sometimes you do so many he goes, because I did a lot of first, you know, I go, hey, you could say, Jumping Angel Falls when I had two base jumps and being with the first big group that ever went there. And I go, yeah, that was memorable. But before that, I jumped El Cap when it was legal. So doing base jump with a regular rig with no training, with a uh, RW rig, I thought, I'm like a living, I'm running off this and dying with the rest of them. But I did it, you know. But coming from behind on the 10th round to win a world championship or a national championship, and like against the team, at one meet, we never led the meet to the 10th round, and the clock is 50 seconds in 10 way. At 49.4. 49.8 seconds. We took the lead in the meet by one point for the first time and two tenths of a second later the meet was over. We win. And we went on to become three time world champion mirror image eight way formation. That was 1981. That's a memory, a memory to come from because everybody else had us beat halfway. We made a lot of mistakes halfway through the meet. We're losing by seven points. And I kept going. We, our motto is we are the champions, queen. They can't beat us, let's keep going. And we overtook them on the very last jump at the very last second, going faster than we ever did. We did a thing in eight way, tempo. Make sure you score the first point before you score two. So if you're gonna be slow, be first slow on the first. As the clock's going out like music, instead of one, two, three, four, you go one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Because this is also the third or fourth or fifth time you've done that sequence. So do it faster at the end of the clock. If you mess up, you lose anyway. But at the beginning, you lose a whole lot of points. At the end, you only lose a little bit of time. So we had that. And we scored at like 45. And then normally the transition and hold back then, it was six seconds in between. And we cut it that time to like four seconds in between. And you had to show the grip to the judges back then because they're shooting from the ground. It wasn't touch and go. You wouldn't get the point. So one other maybe jump. Yeah, in Thailand. World team shirt today. BJ Worth. BJ, I got BJ hooked up in Thailand with the guys I knew that had the power. I've been in Thailand a long time ago. And so... I went back in 79 as coach of the bench. All the guys that were on the line and the guys that got cut or the extras. And when the world team would land and while they're debriefing, we'd get our airplane to go up and I'd get to evaluate these guys. Okay, I'd line them up at the end of the day and I had them, even though I had 50 people, I'd give BJ a hot list. Here's the five best I have. And so, the captains didn't get to come over and from the pit, 50 people get to go, him, him, or him. No, it was the ones that could do good on the dives I gave them. Gave them. And I'd have even the 50th guy. Well, you made six jumps with me yesterday and you didn't get in once. How do you think I'm going to promote you? I'm only building 40 ways. But on the last day, when the team couldn't build a 300 way, they decided they were going to build as big as they could. But the one thing these captains don't have is the uh, sometimes the cojones to cut their friends or the teammates that played their way around the world to come there. And I used to be a judge, or I am a judge, and they would let me walk around then in each captain's room and go, I don't even know your guy's name, but you didn't get in on that last jump. 
you're off. Go to the next show. You guys, the French Patrick Pass, gonna get you some water. Great skydiving. Keep it up. Same with Dieter's group. Great skydiving. Keep it up. You don't have to give them a name. Went to one team out of 12 people. I cut seven of them, and so we ended up with 281 people, and none of the captains or me, who was the guy in charge, at the end we go, okay, we're going to go up. If there's any captain, your last chance that you want to stake your life, that you'll take one of these guys off the bench, and the only slots that are left are like, go out last, and you may be docking last on a 300 way. And I got, these guys can't get in a 40 way, John. And so BJ goes, Bird, who's your co-captain? I go, this military guy right here, he goes, he's now the captain, you're on. So now I'm on world team on this jump. You know, I'm a guy from the beginning of skydiving. And BJ says, just go last. Do you need a dirt dive? I need no stinking dirt dive. Are you going to jump from 25,000 feet and get in one time? I can do that when I'm dead. So. They showed me the person, Andy Farrington, in bright yellow, easiest color in the world to see. You're docking on him on the blue section, go out last. That was the only jump I made with him. We made the world record. That's amazing. How'd I do? Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. We docked, Andy Farrington docks, I'm a quarter second behind him. Andy Farrington was marvelous. You line up in waves to do these things. I heard Point man was lining up there making our rockers too far away from the base formation. And Andy and I are in the back back row. And he realizes that. You know, and he's an instructor in all this. He does like a verbal hop and a weave and goes, does the side body AFF on our point man, flies him forward about 15 feet and says, stay there, let's go, comes back to where we are. So, you know, that's real skydiving. Or on one of the jumps, we had a guy go low who got in the wrong slot. And you're in whackers, and here's two whackers, and his slot's over here. So he's already like low. How's he going to get there by backing up, going around and do that? We unwhack and let him cut across and then re-whack. What else you going to do? He gets in. Thumbs up, mate. That's teamwork. Yeah. Be aware. If he's not in, it don't work. Well, Bird, you let go. Well, we let go so he could get over there. Otherwise, he ain't going to make it up and get in. And so that was like, when you jump with great people, big skydiving a lot simpler. You just be aware. Stay alive out there. So, like I say, a lot of jumps I remember and, you know, countries I've been. Been in over 50 countries in the world. I went to places like Venezuela 14 times. North Shore in Hawaii, Scott Ever Hawaii, Frank Henshaw, 14, 15 times, you know, around the world, maybe 10 times, Bali, Indonesia, Australia, you know, all over every country in your Europe and Scandinavia, Iceland, one of my favorites, you know, but the idea was skydiving is a really fun sport. It's high speed with a lot of energy. My advice to people is, be safe, follow the rules, don't hurt yourself, don't die. It was high speed sport with high speed results. My 40 years after skydiving, 3,000 on round parachutes, I walked away from skydiving without hurting myself. Then I fell out of the tree. Cut. <laughs> yeah. Jerry, thank you so much for talking to us today.